Hello, I'm Omar Jalili. I'm not really. I'm Ricky Gervais. I'm not. I'm Hardeep Singh Kohli. And welcome to Tour of Duty. So, Mr. Alan Davies, ladies and gentlemen, we have been conspiring to meet over the best part of a decade and a half, and here we are, <laughs> first time we've actually met. Nice to see you. To see you. Exactly. Nice. Um, now, I should get out of the way early on. We have a, a massive shared interest in a football club called the, the Mighty Arsenal, people may know them as. You're a season ticket holder. Yeah, and you are too. I, I didn't am. know that. Yeah, no, um, I am very much, very much a follower of the Arsenal. Because when I came to London 23 years ago, um, I lived in northwest London and literally took a map and a ruler. And there was a 0.1 mile difference between Loftus Road and Highbury as was. Um, and what swung it for me was the fact that at the time, Arsenal were managed by Bruce Rioch. Who oh, was a well. Scottish footballer yeah. um, who famously signed Dennis Bergkamp. He certainly did. Uh, and of course, um, Arsene gets all the credit for that, but that's not the case. <laughs> um, how do you manage to fit in uh, games? Because obviously we're a busy club, because um, unlike other clubs like Tottenham, we actually play in a meaningful European Championship. Um, with FA Cup runs, tend to go League Cup, we tend to play. There's a lot of games to get to, yet you manage it. It's hard. If I'm touring, it's hard because of the, they move the games around, the TV companies. And if they move, it's the 5.30 on a Saturday kickoff that kills me because if I'm touring, I've always got a gig on a Saturday night. Um, so this autumn, I'm doing quite a lot of dates. I'm going, I'm going to miss some home games. And then I, well, what would be great is if you could book the theatres after the fixtures were announced. Yeah. But so many people tour nowadays. When I went back to touring in, in 2012, my promoter said, you know, when you last toured in 99, there were about six tours out. Well, now, any time, there are about 80. Which begs certain questions. I mean, you kind of, I get the sense that you sort of fell out of love with live comedy and performing because you had such an amazing beginning to your career. You hit the ground running and were award winning and doing amazing stuff. And then there seemed a period where I can't decide because, you know, I don't know you, but obviously you were very much taken up with the telly stuff. But I also got a sense that you had find a great deal of satisfaction in live work. I think I, uh, I did fall, a bit, uh, fall out of love a little bit with the tour inside of it. And uh, I didn't do stand-up for about 10 years. And also, when I, got, when I was doing a lot of television, it was a bit harder to drop in and do the Comedy Store Late Show because people would start shouting things out, like, why don't you solve this? And, you know, any other reference to anything they could think of. So I kind of... I also wasn't getting any material together because I wasn't gigging much. And then it becomes a bit of a spiral. But I never thought I wouldn't gig for 10 years and then I got married and I had a kid and we did some travelling and I did other things and the years went by and then um, in 2011 I kind of got coerced really into doing some gigs in Australia after we'd been out there doing QI live in theatres and I did a tour in Australia and I spent some time getting new material together and I really enjoyed it and now I'm just totally back into it. It's what I do best I think, it's something I enjoy most anyway. Because you have, um, it, it is really interesting because I came to stand up late, so I kind of had an audience that knew me from other work. So it feels a little bit like a cheat. <laughs> but you've had sort of both. You, you know, in the, in the early days of starting, you know, you were walking into those bear pits. No one had come to see you because no, you know, you were new. But you say bear pits, but people often say that to me. They say, "Oh, wasn't it really hard?" And but actually, when I started out, the circuit was a really nice place to work. There was were only it? about twenty-five clubs. And they were all run in function, mostly run in function rooms of pubs one day a week by real enthusiasts, you know. So if you wanted to play the Bearcat or the Banana or the King's Head in Crouch End or wherever it was you wanted to play or the Screaming Blue Murder, you'd contact directly on the phone the person who ran it. And there was no emailing or texting, you know, you rang them, right? And you knew them all personally and they were all really keen to make their club a good comedy club. So they took a lot of care over the MC and the running order and the balance of the acts and... And it was a really nurturing environment, actually. It was, and there were a lot of good people around. Lee Evans and Eddie Izzard and Joe Brand and all these people were people around when I started, and, and Bill Bailey and everyone. So I don't, I don't know what it's like now, but it felt like a good place. I worked in that environment for five years, and the only clubs that were really felt, you felt like were tough were the jongleurs clubs because mm. they were so big, and they served pitches of lager to tables. <laughs> That's not, it's not a good beginning to the evening when you see 12 pitches of lager going out and you go, oh, this is going to be hairy by half 11. But they were still good gigs because they were packed, you know, and there, wasn't, there weren't that many places. And I think the circuit now, there are a lot of clubs and a lot of places and a lot of people who want to do comedy and maybe it's spread too thin. 
and uh, maybe it's tougher to get going now. Um, perhaps that will address itself. One of the problems is so many people tour in, and, they, and especially the arena shows, where they charge so much money for a ticket. If you spend your comedy pound there, now you don't really go to your local comedy club so much. So that's that's a bit of a problem. I mean, you know, you, you know, you 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 are you know you are older now than when you started. You've had a, a breadth of life experience. You've travelled a lot. Married with Bill Bailey, I believe, is the best funny at a wedding, which is always going to be. Yes, he was. It was very nice, and it was on his birthday as well, so it was even doubly nice of him to do it. I had just an image of him <laughs> with a keyboard. Just well, he did funny. play the piano. We got married in a really nice country house in the winter in January. And so when people were arriving, um, we had mulled wine on the go, and Bill was playing the piano, <laughs> which is what he used to do. He used to play the piano when he was, you know, very much younger, obviously. He would play the piano to entertain in, I don't know quite exactly where, hotel foyers, I don't know. But you can imagine with Bill, there was a bit of a twist to everything. He was Definitely just doing green sleeves, you know. <laughs> I, I, but the question I'm asking in the sense is that there is a different expectation of you now. You talk about people spending their comedy pound. Um, Coming to see you on tour isn't just a night, you know, I'm going to see a comic, you know, they're going to see Al Davis, do you know what I mean? It's, it's a big night. Uh, and in terms of your material, playing to much bigger venues um, on a much grander scale, um, and with that level of expectation, how does that impact on the material you choose? And, and Or are you quite free and just in a position where you say, this is what I want to do. How does that balance well, out? Well, I, I am, I suppose, but really, with material, you really just, it's like gold, you know? So you'll take anything you can find, any idea you can find, and jot it down, and then try it, and if it works, you'll keep developing it, you know? Things, some things you can keep trying, and they just end up with it, but most things you can find a way, if you find it funny, you should be doing it, that's what I think. And if you really think, well, that might be a bit tricky, you should really try harder to do it. And, and it, it, it makes sometimes it can be a little bit darker than normal and that's quite fun because the audience turn up and they all like QI or maybe they like Jonathan Creek and, and then the comedy is maybe not what they expected but that's fine. I'm not super edgy, you know, I'm very accessible but it's quite fun for me sometimes to see the reaction of a crowd who've got often have no idea that I was ever a stand-up comedian and they don't yeah. even really know what's coming, you know, and, uh, and after a couple of minutes sometimes they're having to sort of adjust their sets a little bit because it's not... He's not solving anything, and he's not an absolute idiot, you know, he's a bit of an idiot, but he's not that bad as he is on QI. <laughs> um, what's the show about, the new tour? Um, it's a lot about family, actually, it's, um, and, it's, and it's all aspects of parenting, so it's uh, the struggles of procreation come into it a little bit, um, relationships with my own father is not well at the moment come into it, and, uh, because I can, now I'm a bit older, and I, I can touch on things, you know, bereavement and illness and things like that that I might not have done in the past. Um, it does interest me because, I mean, you know, there are, you have a, a relatively unique trajectory. There's a handful of people, um, Jack D, I suppose, and, and Joe Brand, but with the greatest respect to both of them, brilliant performers, you are a BBC One primetime home banking talent in terms of television, you know, measured in the millions of viewers. Um, and so I imagine there is a desire to keep your private life private when you're that high profile. And yet, when you do a show, that stand up, your every impulse is to share the truth. Is there any relation between trying to keep yourself private in the television work, yet give the real you on a show? I don't know, I haven't really thought about that. Um, that's why I'm here, to make you think about things. It's a prober, it's a good one. Um, I think, well as a stand up, I think, um, you're very careful, I think, with which parts of your life you discuss or we start with going to be funny. And there are some things that have happened to me and around me that I haven't done comedy about, you know. Um, I'm not exploiting members of my family to make a living. To I'm sure. <laughs> I just I wonder if there are certain things you, you may, you know, a, you know, a new stand up who has no TV profile and who the the papers aren't interested in can say pretty much what they want but I just wonder whether that informs the choice of your material can say oh I don't want to say that because if I start talking about my children in that way then it leads to X, Y and Z or do you just feel I don't think it does Hardy to be honest with you I don't think it's, it's in terms of the scurrilous side of the press mm. they're not really interested in what you're doing in your act you know they want they want the thing that you don't want anyone to know about. And what is the thing you don't want anyone well, to know about? They're, they're, I'm, I'm not doing any of those things anymore. Are you not? What a <laughs> shame to have met you at this point. I'm fancy busy being married with children. I'm so boring. It's a kebab out of the question. 
Um, now you're back, you know, for the last four years, you've been back touring and gigging. How much, um, you know, having just done Edinburgh, how much has Edinburgh changed for you from doing it in the early days? Well, it's huge now. It's really, well, it's obvious to say. Uh, and the venues all shift around. And you get the comedy thing is dominated by these four kind of huge organisations. And so it's a different feel and vibe to what it used to be. It feels very like a business. But uh, the free fringe is new. That wasn't there in the no. old days. And people were doing shows on the free fringe. And that seems to be where all the, a lot of the weird and wacky stuff is. And where you feel like you're taking a punt on a show, you know. And, uh, I, I dislike the fact that the whole thing is subsidised by the performers. I really dislike the fact that you have to you go online to buy a ticket and the, the website says it's sold out and you get to the venue and it's not sold out because you haven't gone to all the other ticketing agencies who've taken lots of the tickets. And when, when they run out of their quota, they don't direct you to the next agency, they just direct you to another show. So all that side of things, which you think of as kind of West End or national tour practice, invading the Fringe Festival, I think that's rock. There are fringe festivals in Canada like we used to do years ago and they'd sell half the tickets in advance and the other half we had to queue up for it. and that meant there were always lines and that was quite an exciting thing when mm. people were out on the street trying to get tickets and they're actually out, actual bits of paper in their hands. Because the interesting the only visual uh, side of, of, of Edinburgh these days is the queues to get into gigs and that's almost in a sense too late. You know, if you're looking at who's got a long queue, the nice thing about the Canadian model you mentioned is that there are queues on the d earlier in the day yeah, to, to get your tickets, tickets yeah, rather to get than to get ticket, the gig. Yeah. I mean, there are a few, there are a few things about it which are, you would change if you could. But the, overall, it's fantastic here. I mean, it's so good. I love being here. I love being in the city. It's a great city. I don't know how many people there are. I don't know there are so many great shows. You feel like if you've seen two shows in a day, you've had a light day. Yeah. You could see five or six in a day, do your own in the evening, and then there's people to see. It's like a convention, there are people I don't see all year round, and then I know they're going to be here. So I absolutely love the Edinburgh Festival. And once you've completed the tour, what are your plans? More telly? Uh, yeah, I did a show for Dave called Untitled, and we're doing more of those. Doing more QI. And so I'll be quite busy for a bit. And also, we have this commonality as well, which I haven't spoken about yet, which is your chefing. Oh really? Yeah, because I'm I cook. I'm, I do a bit of shit right, right, well. okay. And of course, you did white. Well, white. Well, the thing is, white's got cancelled, which is still um, I'm still embittered about and annoyed about. Like even four years later, and that that was one of the reasons I got back into stand up because I started to think. Well, I wrote a book now on bought it. I'm doing podcasts, but you can't make any money from them. They can the sitcom. What am I doing? I'm putting all these efforts into all these things. Why don't I just do some gigs? So in a way, that was a silver lining. But yeah, I, I loved doing whites. And the thing about whites was Matt King, who you mm. probably know, uh, co-wrote it. He was a chef. Yeah. So the thing about all that kitchen stuff was it was really accurate. And they, I got lots of tweets from people in the in the business saying, "This is so good. This is exactly what it's like in the kitchen." And that was really nice. And that was because probably explains why the BBC didn't continue. They didn't with understand it. what they no, were looking at. Of course at. they didn't. <laughs> of course they didn't. Not enough middle class people in it. And then since then, Catherine Parkinson and Darren Boyd, who were my co-stars in it, both won BAFTAs for other shows for being the best comic performers in the country, which I have no doubt that they are. And they broke up that cast, you know. Matt and Ollie Lansley, who co-wrote it, don't have written together since. So I think the whole thing was a tragedy, I think. Ollie's here in, in, in Edinburgh and um, doing great shows with his theatre company, so I saw him last night. Lovely to meet you. Finally, I can't you believe too. we've generally gone this long as both <laughs> Arsenal fans and people that work in this mad world. Um, very nice to meet you, sir. You too.